and welcome to the Automation Village breakout session for today, uh, May 21st. I'm Dave Spencer, and joining me today, we're going to have Paladine America to speak about uh, Valve they've created. Uh, we're also going to be followed up with uh, GuidePoint Security and then a presentation by uh, SEL. So first up, Brian Cook there, who's going to be talking to us about um, the Valves that they've created. Uh, Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yourself? I'm doing very well, thank you. So Brian, why don't you introduce your topic at a kind of a high level, um, and then whenever you're ready, feel free to grab the screen and you can kind of get in and, and take things away. Yeah, so um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian Crook. I am the Director of Sales and Operations for uh, Paladon Americas. Uh, we are an actuator manufacturer uh, that has uh, facilities based in Italy, the UK, and the United States. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, sales and operations uh, in North America, uh, South America, Latin America uh, as well. So uh, today's topic is probably probably the most uh, most exciting for us is our uh, EHSY series uh, electrohydraulic control system, uh, as well as uh, the actuator that goes on it. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, why we developed the product, uh, some of the technology that's in it, uh, what makes it uh, probably the I guess you'd say the best mousetrap on the market. Cool. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Would you like me to go ahead and continue? When, uh, yeah, Dave? whenever you're whenever okay. you're ready, feel free to rock and roll. So I'm going to start a little bit with the history on uh, Paladon uh, Americas and Paladon Systems. Our parent company is Paladon Systems. They are uh, based out of uh, the UK. Uh, we have manufacturing facility uh, in Bergenova, Viltadoni, Italy, uh, which is about an hour outside of Milan, Italy. Uh, and then uh, in the UK, we're in Bricksworth. Uh, so anyways, the company was founded in 1981 uh, by a gentleman by the name of Brian Enever. Uh, Brian at the time was the largest uh, Emerson or, or Bettis distributor uh, in Europe. And uh, in 1999, uh, a company called Galveston Houston, who used to own the Bettis brand, sold out to Emerson. And Brian saw that as a potential conflict for himself. Uh, so he ended up uh, hiring uh, the gentleman that had designed uh, both the Ladine uh, and the Biffy Italia actuators. Uh, so we've actually been producing uh, these actuators you see behind me here uh, since 1999. Um, they were designed uh, for really extreme uh, environments uh, because they were designed to work in the North Slope. Uh, they're designed for uh, low temperature and really extreme heavy duty high cycle applications. Uh, in 2011, we established Paladon Americas, and the purpose of Paladon Americas was to serve the United States and Canada, and Mexico, and, Latin America, and South America. Um, and we've been producing actuators here in Houston, Texas. All of our modules and components that you see, things like our, things like our spring cylinders that you see, or maybe this hydraulic cylinder right here on the table, uh, these components are made in our factory uh, in Italy. And then all the final assembly is actually done here in Houston, Texas. Um, the content of our actuators is 100% uh, Western European. Uh, so we don't have any Chinese import stuff. Uh, we haven't been affected by uh, the COVID uh, virus as far as things getting shut down. So we've been able to keep up with that. But it allows us to control the process. Uh, one of the things that we're able to do here, because we assemble everything, final assembly, testing, painting is all done here. It allows us to be very quick. It allows us to be responsive and, and flexible. And those are really important things when it comes to being in an industry where you're serving the customer and you're essentially solving their problems. I like to think of us maybe as, uh, as therapists for valve automation because uh, that's what we do. Uh, so the EHSY series electrohydraulic, uh, the gentleman that designed it is our engineering manager, Mr. Gary Robbins. Uh, he was actually the founder of one of the largest actuator manufacturers here in Houston. And uh, he sold that business years ago. And uh, basically our electrohydraulic control system is a culmination of us listening to what the industry complained about. Electrohydraulics typically are, are messy, they're sloppy. Um, they can burn out the motors, they burn out the pumps, they burn out a lot of components. So what we did is we actually developed a, a, a unit that is not only uh, programmable, uh, has an onboard logic controller that operates it. It's programmable, uh, it's scalable, 
um, and we're able to provide really the best value in the entire industry right now with our electrohydraulic uh, control system. So I'm going to go ahead and get in, uh, started in it. We wanted to do this in a live format. I do have a, a PowerPoint presentation, but I think it's great when you can actually see it, touch it, feel it. Uh, so this is the next best thing. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we build our electrohydraulic control system in both quarter turn, which would be like these actuators here behind us, and then we also do it in linear. So we're able to do automate uh, valves in quarter turn up through 48 inch diameter uh, in, a, in a quarter turn ball valve. And then in the linear, we're able to do up to uh, 65,000 foot pounds of thrust. Uh, so we're able to do things like gate valves and globe valves and things that have a linear motion uh, versus a quarter turn. So we do both. Um, we're really proud of this system because we offer it in several different voltages. The first one is 24 volt DC. The next one is 120 volt AC, 220 volt AC, 480 volt three phase. Um, but in listening to the industry, we took it a step further. Uh, we were actually able to add things like solar. So we do build units where it has a solar panel on the unit. Uh, we also build these units with uh, things like wind turbines. Um, we wanted to be able to give people a solution that would work off-grid, which this does. Uh, if we do uh, solar or wind turbine, we can also do solar and wind turbine in environments where they ha need both. Uh, but when we couple this uh, to our units, we actually have an enclosure that goes down below. It'll have a charge controller, a power inverter. And then what we do is we size a deep cycle battery bank to supply your auxiliary power or your, your actual uh, power. Um, so you don't need utility power with this system, uh, which is really unique about it. We're actually the only manufacturer of an electrohydraulic uh, actuator and control system that can provide this turnkey right, right from the factory. So I've worked in the industry for a long time. And when I sold electrohydraulic actuators, they like to leak, they like to catapult themselves and destroy themselves. And if you wanted something like solar or wind turbine, you'd have to kind of piecemeal it all together and build your own package. We're pleased to offer that as a turnkey thing right from our factory here. Uh, the next thing is, is uh, we also offer battery backup. So if you have an application where the customer has utility power, uh, we can do a battery backup in the event that they were to uh, lose power. Um, the next thing is, is the control system on this uh, is available in both analog control, which would just be a voltage control. It could be 120 volt AC to open and close, uh, 24 volt DC, uh, but we also offer it in uh, digital control. Uh, for example, uh, this unit has built in uh, right from the, the factory. We have Modbus built into it. It can also act as a host or it can act as a slave. So if you had multiple units on, on, on a, in a location, the first unit would actually act as essentially a router, and all the other units would actually be wired back to that one. So it cuts down on wiring individually to each uh, unit. Um, the next thing that we're really proud about uh, is the fact that we offer environmentally friendly uh, hydraulic fluid. Our standard fluid is going to be ISO 32. ISO 32 is something that's available at an O'Reilly Auto Parts or a tractor supply or Canadian tire for you folks. Um, so it's, it's a standard hydraulic fluid, but the environmentally friendly one is made from propylene glycol, which is essentially what's in your uh, radiator on your vehicle. Uh, it is pet friendly, it's environmentally friendly. Uh, typically when we do a solar wind turbine unit uh, to complete that, that environmentally friendly zero emission uh, product, we also put the uh, uh, propylene glycol uh, fluid in there. We also have offer a low temp unit. Uh, so we're able to, to build this unit uh, to operate down to negative 40 F, uh, up to 180 degrees F. When we do that, we actually replace the hydraulic fluid with a hydraulic fluid that's made by uh, Bobo. Uh, and it's an aviation based hydraulic fluid. So it's designed for ultra low temp operation. When we do that, we also install an electric heater in the enclosure here. It's approximately 50 watt electric heater. And that allows us to keep all the components at an operating temperature, as well as the liquid crystal display that is on our logic controller. If you go below zero, liquid crystal does not flow below zero F or zero C. Uh, so by adding that uh, heater to it, it allows that to function. Uh, the logic controller itself will still function down to negative 40. 
Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is what that onboard logic controller does. Um, we're the only ones that do it. Uh, there's nobody else that makes an electrohydraulic with an onboard logic controller. It allows us to scale the product. It allows us to build in a lot of features that nobody else offers. And it allows us to customize the unit for the customer. So we can take the customer's most difficult or wildest control scheme and we can build it into this unit because we have the inputs and outputs. We're able to add expansion modules for things like 40, 20 milliamp feedback. We're also able to add expansion modules to modulate the unit uh, on things like control valves. Um, but the biggest thing is the standard features that come with this unit. Um, the first one is we do not use a typical limit switch. Uh, I'll show you an example of a limit switch. This is just a typical limit switch. This is a mechanical limit switch. So when you make contact, you'll see the little LED lights up. And when it closes, you'll see the red LED lights up. The problem with mechanical limit switches is they tend to drift. They are not very accurate. They're extremely difficult to use to start and stop a, an electric motor. So what we do with ours is we don't use a pressure switch. We actually use a pressure transducer. That pressure transducer is what starts and stops our system, but it also allows us to monitor the, or the static pressure on our hydraulic manifold as well as the system. So now we're building in features where we can detect a leak. Now we're starting and stopping a motor using a repeatable device versus using an on-off device that is hard to set like a limit switch. The next thing uh, that, that, that we do with our uh, uh, logic controller is we offer phase monitoring. So for a 480 volt three phase or any three phase system, we're actually able to add a phase monitor here to the DIN rail and that allows us to monitor phases. If, you, if the customer were to drop a phase, it's wired back into the logic controller and it would send an alarm contact back to the control room. The other guys do not offer that type of stuff. The next thing is, is we have a fluid level alarm. You'd think that this would be a standard feature on everybody's unit. It's not. Uh, we're the only ones that I know of that make it standard. And we do that because if you were to develop a leak in the system and you ran low on hydraulic fluid, there's a, there's a theory in, there's a theory in, uh, um, in physics. And in physics, it tells you that you cannot destroy energy. You can only convert it. Okay? So what ends up happening here, if you run out of hydraulic fluid, eventually that hydraulic fluid is going to heat up. You're going to burn out seals and things like that. You're going to burn out the pump. You might burn out the motor. Our unit cannot self-destruct. And the reason why is because we have motor run protection. We have uh, motor fail, uh, motor start too many time protection, and then we have the hydraulic fluid level alarm. If they run low on hydro hydraulic fluid, they can close an alarm contact. They can actually let the customer know, hey, you have a problem with this unit. You have a low fluid level alarm. It actually displays the alarms right here on the logic controller. It'll also uh, send it back to the control room. On some of our units, we actually add an external uh, screen. Uh, so it would display it on the external screen as well. The next thing that we have uh, is going to be motor run protection. There's two, different, uh, there's two different types of motor run protection. There's motor run too long and motor start too many times. In both instances, if it does go into that, it'll actually display on the controller and notify, again, the customer's control room. Our competitors don't have that option. And therein lies the, one of the issues that people had in the industry is if the motor continues to run, you're going to burn things up. If the motor starts too many times because you have a leak somewhere in the system, it's going to keep starting and starting and starting. Eventually, you're going to burn out the pump. Well, we make it so you can't do that. And what we do is if our motor starts six times in 15 minutes without a change in the control state, so if it's modulating, if your 4 to 20 milliamp doesn't change, or if it's on off and it, the state doesn't change, this unit will actually go into motor run protection and it'll alert the customer's control room as well as display the alarm here. The next one is motor run too long. This would be especially beneficial if you had a leak and you were drawing down the hydraulic fluid and eventually you ran out of hydraulic fluid. Motor run too long is a feature that we have built into the unit. We know how long it takes for this unit to actually stroke the valve. So we build into our software uh, a certain amount of time and a buffer it says if this motor runs too long, 
it needs to go into motor run protection. Once again, it'll display on the screen that the motor has run too long. On this particular demonstration unit, you'll see here that this actually takes about six seconds to open. So we know that it takes six seconds to open this unit. If, when we build this into the software on this one, the motor run protection is set at about three minutes. So if it can't fully get to end of travel in three minutes, it goes into motor run protection. It prevents this motor from getting burned out. It prevents you from destroying this pump. It just protects the unit. The unit is smart, intuitive. Uh, it can warn you when you have a problem. You don't have to wait until something gets to failure before you find out you have a problem. I'm gonna go ahead and close this down real quick. The, the, next thing that, uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, modulating. Um, last year, we started working on the development of a, a modulating unit. We had customers that were asking us uh, for the ability to position the valve or modulate the valve. Uh, we just launched that uh, actually last month. Uh, so we do offer this in a modulating unit. So not only is it used as an ESD, um, it can be an ESD and also a modulating actuator and control system. Uh, we talked about the low temp. The other thing that's really unique about this unit is it's a fully self-contained system. What that means is that the hydraulic fluid is piped in on, the, on both sides of the cylinder in the back here, so there's nothing that goes to atmosphere. Uh, we don't have to worry about ink, water ingress, dust, sand, any type of environmental concerns with stuff getting into the back side of the cylinder. What's also unique about that is it allows us to use the same size enclosure on every valve all the way up through about a 20 inch 600 pound, generally speaking. When you get above 20 inch and it gets to a larger actuator, the enclosure maintains the same footprint, but the depth gets a little bit deeper. And that just allows us to add a larger reservoir. The reason why we're able to keep it relatively small is because of the hydraulic fluid being on both sides of the cylinder. When you actually stroke this cylinder here, all you have to displace is you have the volumetric displacement of the piston rod is all that goes in and out of this hydraulic cylinder. So we don't have to have a huge reservoir. Uh, in fact, this reservoir on this system, on this size of a system at about 6,000 inch pounds is, is more than overkill. So we're able to do that. Uh, another thing that we have built into all of our units, uh, it's really important in, in critical applications, is partial stroke test. Uh, that is standard uh, with our units. Uh, those of you that are not familiar with partial stroke test, uh, it's a great feature to have, especially on critical valves, maybe in a plant, a gas plant, a chemical plant, a food processing plant. Wherever there's a critical valve, this is a really important feature to have. We can actually program the unit to partially stroke the valve. And it's a great feature because it won't fully disrupt the process, so you can continue running. But what it does is it proves that when called upon in an emergency, that this unit has the ability to fail a valve open or fail a valve closed, depending on your control scheme. So it's a critical component. It's customizable. It's programmable. We set it at the factory here in our software for you. Um, we have the ability to automate uh, up through, like I said, a 48-inch, 600-pound uh, ball valve, uh, which covers virtually anything you'll see in the market. And then we also have, in the linear applications, the ability to do up to 65,000 uh, foot-pounds of thrust. Um, this same unit, uh, is it's the same unit for both 120 volt and 220 volt. Uh, it's just a simple change in the wiring on the motor. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is the enclosure. Um, our standard enclosure on these, uh, this is what the, uh, the unit looks like on the outside here when the door is on it. Very clean and simple. Uh, we basically adapted the technology that we had uh, for Paladon Systems over in Italy and in Europe. And what we did is we adapted it to the US market. People wanted an enclosure, everything in an enclosure. People wanted everything to, to be clean looking, kind of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, our standard enclosure is going to be an IP66 uh, rated. Um, and then it's a NEMA 4 uh, rating on the area classification. Uh, we also offer the enclosure in an IP68, uh, uh, which would be in environments where you may have corrosives. Uh, so it would be a stainless steel, possibly a plastic, phenolic uh, material uh, for that type of stuff. Uh, our standard electrical on this unit is going to be class one, div two. 
Okay, this is environments where something that is explosive, whether it be a gas or a dust, can be present, but not all the time. We do also offer it in class one, div one, which means that there is an explosive combustible present at all times. So we do offer it both ways. We just move some of our electronics into uh, a class one, div one enclosure. Uh, and then it gets uh, the proper seals on that. So we do make it in class one, div two standard. Class one, div one is optional. Um, another thing that uh, I want to talk about is going to be uh, the fact that it is zero emissions. Uh, we have zero emissions with this product. Uh, another nice thing about uh, this unit is it also meets uh, the latest uh, federal government guidelines. I want to say they came out in October. Uh, it's called 49 CFR. 192 and 49 CFR 195, uh, and I'll give you the, the short version. Essentially, what it says is that pipeline operators must have a fail-safe device on every valve. It doesn't call out whether they're close to a utility grid or not. It says that it has to have a fail-safe device. Now, that, that caveat is if there is not an operator. So there's lots of pipelines in, in the United States and Canada and all over the world where they have valves and they have an electric actuator on them. An electric actuator is essentially a high speed, low torque electric motor. In order to drive a valve open or close, it requires electricity. You have electricity to open, electricity to close. The only inherent issue with a standard electric actuator is if you lose power, it fails exactly where it's at. So what's nice about this unit is not only can we operate off-grid with no utility power, um, but we can fail a valve closed using electric. So basically, this is an electric actuator. Uh, it's just using an electric motor to drive a hydraulic pump that compresses a spring on the uh, actuator. The spring is your stored energy. Um, and then if the customer needed to operate remotely uh, in an environment where there's no grid or utility power, that's when we would do the solar or the wind turbine. The other thing that, that is also great about why this meets the 49 CFR, <coughs> excuse me, 192 and 195, is we offer an expansion module. Uh, the expansion module goes on the side of this enclosure here. It would integrate with the customer's pressure transmitter, uh, pressure switch, whatever pressure uh, monitoring device they have. It would be wired back into this monitoring piece of equipment. It monitors high-low uh, pressure on the on the uh, pipeline. And what's nice is it's user settable. So the customer can go out and they can say, hey, this pipeline, we don't want it to operate below 500 PSI, but we don't want it to operate above 950. In the event that we drop below this low or go above this high, it should trigger a shutdown. So we can actually, the customer can actually program the pressures uh, high and low into the unit. And in the event uh, that uh, they did have a, a pipeline rupture or line break, or an overpressurization of a pipeline, once again, they can be in a location where there's no utility power and this unit can trigger an actual shutdown. So you don't need an operator sitting in a control room watching a traditional electric actuator to open and close it. In the event that you lost power, you wouldn't be able to open or close it. It would stay exactly where it's at. So this unit gives you that full protection that meets the full 49 CFR 192 and 195. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is going to be about uh, the uh, accumulator. We use a high-pressure hydraulic fluid accumulator in our units. Uh, on the back side of it, it is charged with nitrogen, which is an inert gas. It's non-explosive. Uh, and it allows us to start the motor and immediately start stroking the valve. So one of the things here is we have high-pressure hydraulic fluid on the system at all times. We have the pressure transducer that starts and stops, but also monitors hydraulic pressure. And you'll see when I give this thing a control signal, you can look down below, it'll immediately start moving. With most hydraulic pumps, you have to build up hydraulic pressure to create a motive. Once you build up enough pressure, that motive is what will move something. Uh, with ours, because we keep high pressure on the unit at all times, it's gonna immediately start moving. And if you can hear it in the audio, you can hear it start to build up pressure and you kind of hear the motor change uh, a little, change its tone a little bit. That's when it starts to get to end of travel. We have the 
the operating pressure programmed into the logic control. It knows when it gets to end of travel. It knows what that pressure should be. It also knows if there was a leak and it got below a certain point, it would automatically restart the motor to retain, uh, remain in that position. So what's nice with this is we're able to control the speed at which it opens or closes. Uh, we can put a larger uh, hydraulic pump on to go faster. We're going to put a smaller one on there to go slower. On the closing side, we can actually uh, customize the speed using flow control valves. This particular unit's going to close in about a second and a half. So closes very quickly, which is great for an emergency shutdown system, but we have the ability to slow it down. I'll give you an example. We have a unit that uh, we quoted yesterday. It closes in about eight seconds. The customer wants it to be 30 seconds. We're able to put a flow control valve in there and do that. The other thing that's really cool with this unit is we have a manual override as well. So in the event that the customer lost power, their batteries were dead, whatever the circumstances are, and they wanted to manually open this valve, we have up here an auto normal uh, mode, which is lockable. And then we also have the manual mode, which you can change to. Again, we have a proximity switch here. So when I change this unit from auto normal to manual mode, what will happen is it says right on the onboard logic controller that is not in the normal mode. Uh, so once again, it can actually send an alarm contact back to the control room. Somebody knows that somebody in the field is attempting to operate this thing remotely or that they won't be able to control it remotely uh, while it's being operated in the field. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys the operation on this. Uh, the hydraulic override, it's a double acting hydraulic pump. So these, this will open the valve extremely quickly. It's about five and a half or six strokes it takes to fully open the valve. The other nice feature with this unit is uh, what we simulated here is maybe a loss of control or loss of power. In this case, we can say, okay, the power has been restored. Uh, we have a control signal. So we have a control signal. The valve is already open, right? Control signal says open. Uh, when I go back to the auto normal mode, what will happen is this pump's going to fire just long enough to see that the pressure is already at end of travel, and it'll see the limit switch on the back as the secondary confirmation, and it'll start and stop very, very quickly. So what's nice is when an operator goes out and resets something or they had a communications issue, once that's resolved and you go out and turn this back into the auto normal mode, the unit will sustain or maintain its existing position. So you don't have to worry about the unit closing and restarting and, 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 and going back to its uh, starting point. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the lead times. Because we build this product 100% in-house, uh, every single component that goes into this hydraulic control system is sourced from manufacturers in the United States and, and in North America. Um, the only component that is not 100% uh, American made is going to be the logic controller. It's made in Japan. Uh, outside of that, we're really pleased to be able to be working with people in, in the United States and sourcing materials from people. It allows us to have the best lead time in the entire industry. Uh, some of our competitors in this space, uh, I've seen actually a competitor uh, yesterday uh, quoted 30 weeks on a delivery. Uh, we quoted two to three weeks on the, on the same package. Uh, identical package. So um, typically, though, a lot of our competitors are in the 20 to 30 week range. Our standard lead times is three to four weeks. Uh, we will do them sooner. Uh, we have the ability to build one in a couple of days if we need to. Uh, we would charge us a small expedite fee to do that, but it, we want to be that manufacturer that is flexible. We want to be the manufacturer that designs products where we listen to the end users and, and we we build products that people want to buy, not that they feel like they have to buy. Um, the other thing is, is uh, the price. Uh, we represent the best value in the entire industry. Uh, you see all the, the standard features that come on the unit. You see some of the add-ons that we can do. These are all things that our competitors don't offer. Or they don't really have a way of doing it. Um, also, our units are, are, we're not using proprietary boards and proprietary components that you have to buy strictly from the manufacturer. The magic in ours is really in the control system and in the logic that goes into controlling everything. So um, we typically rep represent the best value in the entire industry as far as features, benefits, standard features. 
the price and the delivery. And then the last thing that I want to talk about is the, the customization. Um, we, like I said, we can take the most difficult application that the customer has and we will attack it like it's something that we do every day. And we will build into the features what the customer needs and that will allow us, that'll allow us to uh, serve the customer. Uh, that's really one of the tenets or principles of our business is be the company that people want to do business with, not the company that they have to do business with because they don't have a choice. So uh, in closing, that's, that's my presentation on the product. Um, I appreciate you guys joining us. And uh, if Dave would like to go ahead and open this up to uh, questions, I'm going to go ahead and just grab my, grab my chair and sit down and, uh, and we'll go ahead and start taking some questions. Sure thing, Brian. Thanks very much. That was a, that was a great presentation. Yes, sir. Thank you. So what I'm going to do, uh, we do have a few questions here, um, but I'm going to just quickly share uh, the screen so that anybody who's come on after the fact can see where they can enter the questions. Um, so if you're, if you're just joining us, then you'll see a little Q&A button in your little Zoom console there. Uh, you can just click that button, type in the question you want. Uh, that'll, appear, that'll appear on my screen, and uh, we'll run through that with Brian. So and it'll be the same thing for the next uh, presentations. Just enter your questions there, and we'll ask them um, you know, at the end of the presentation. So in this case, I'm going to uh, just stop that share again, just to, to make you a little um, bigger for everybody again, Brian. Um, yes, say we turned into pretty small thumbnails when I'm sharing. So, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, you doing your presentation. It's amazing how uh, how many things really need to be considered, and you know, a lot of that I'm sure um, is based on your guys' experience in the industry. Um, you know, things that you've learned, and you know, there's probably ten ways to solve a problem, and uh, you know, through experience, I guess you figure out. Uh, which items you track and and how best to um, to configure your system for that well it's kind of it's kind of interesting you know like the development of this product it really you know I came on board in, in January and took over running the business and and it was interesting because the way that the way that they developed this product behind me is really the way that I've made my whole career and that is I've always focused on just listening to the customer and if you you know, the, the old saying, if you, if you talk half as much as you listen, you can solve people's problems. And, and people want their problems to be solved. They want somebody that they can trust and count on. And it was interesting because this product really was developed because customers said, hey, oh, electrohydraulics, it's a great concept. It, it, it allows us to make a large valve uh, fail safely uh, electrically. But ah, they leak all the time. The motors burn out. Things... So we listen and we built something that people want to buy. We basically wanted to innovate on a product that in some cases people were like, yeah, this is, yeah, I like it, but I don't want to, I don't really want to use it. So we, we listened and I feel like this is the people's product. Like we, we built this, we built this for them. And it's funny because we keep, we keep listening. We keep adding features like the phase monitoring. That wasn't always standard. We had a customer that said, Hey, We'd, it would be really nice if you guys could add that. And we said, okay, let's, let's look at it. And, and sure enough, now we've made phase monitoring standard on a three-phase unit. Um, the low fluid level alarm. Um, you know, we have competitors that they make it an option. And to me, it just seems, it seems like it should be standard. You know, protect the unit from destroying itself. And, you know, I, what it costs me for that low fluid level alarm to know that I'm building a product that, it's going to last. It, it's such an insignificant amount of money that to make it standard just makes sense. So we're, we're very much focused on listening and building products that people want to buy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that really came across in your presentation there. Um, so I'll, I'll lead in with, uh, with one question here. Um, and the question is, is there an alarm in the case the valve is stroking and suddenly is jammed by an object in the line? Yes, sir. Uh, it's actually, so on the back of the unit, I, I'm not able to really show it to you guys uh, just because we don't have a secondary camera, but on the back of the unit, uh, there is a limit switch on there. Uh, it has uh, four single pole double throw switches in there. Um, it is used for secondary proof of open and closure. It is also used, uh, there's two extra switches in there for the customer for their system. And what it does is uh, it's used for partial stroke, uh, but 
it's also a secondary proof of closure. So going back to our, our software and the logic that's built into it, we know on the unit behind us it takes six seconds to open. We know that if the motor runs more than three minutes, it'll shut the, shut the motor run or turn on motor run protection. We know that if it doesn't complete end of travel and make contact with that limit switch in a certain amount of time, that we have a valve jammed. And actually, our unit will actually tell you uh, valve tra uh, travel or valve jam. Uh, so that way you know that something has gotten in the way of the full travel of the valve. So it's a great question. Thank you for asking. Right. And, and kind of a follow-up to that. Um, you, you say that the, that the unit will tell you about these things. Um, how exactly does it normally do that? Are you guys doing um, like remote or wireless um, or, or how is this, um, how does it actually get back to a, a SCADA system or whatever typically? It, it would basically be through the alarm contact. Uh, so depending on, uh, depending on how many alarms, you could put individual alarms for every one of them or you could do a single alarm for any one of the alarm failures that you could have, just alerting you that there was an alarm. So it really, it really falls back on the, the customer's imagination or how much how many alarms they want. Uh, we have the ability, there's eight input outputs on the, the unit standard, and then we can add up to two expansion modules that add an additional uh, eight per module. So we can go up to 16 different outputs. Right, okay, cool. All right, and um, for, your, for your class one div one system, are you guys, uh, how are you guys doing the, um, the explosion proof for that is it is it purging or flame pass or how, do you know how uh, it's it's going to be flame pass and uh, all the tubing is going to be explosion proof and then we use the uh, we use the the fittings and then they get the chico they call it is the is the slang for it they put the chico in there and that at that uh, puts the seal on it right okay very cool yep. great question yeah, so, yeah no problem that's uh, yeah, so that's everything we have right now. Like I say, if you have a question and you'd like to get it answered, please just uh, enter it into the little uh, Q&A box there um, and it'll pop up on the screen. Um, otherwise, while we wait for that, uh, did you want to just quickly run through? I, I know you've got uh, a really nice uh, setup there. Um, there's a number of other devices here. Did you want to quickly run through? Somebody might be looking at something in the background there. Yeah, and, yeah, I'm absolutely. Curious. We can do that. So uh, we were talking about uh, Paladon, uh, Paladon Systems being our parent company and uh, us manufacturing actuators. So obviously the, the, the focus of this presentation was on our electrohydraulic control system, uh, but we also build uh, quarter turn Scotch oak actuators. Uh, we also build uh, your small little rack and pinion style actuators that you see here. Uh, so we have those. Uh, we make linear actuators. Uh, we make all of our actuators uh, in hydraulic. We make them in pneumatic. We also make direct gas, uh, so we can do high pressure direct gas systems. What's really unique about our Scotch Oak is our direct gas cylinder and our hydraulic cylinder are the same, same product that was designed to accept either or. Um, it allows us to build a, a, a direct gas system very quickly, uh, up to 3,625 uh, PSI of direct gas. Uh, and then our hydraulic system as well, it goes up to 3,625. So, we have the ability to operate our actuators on things like nitrogen or, or compressed air or any type of natural gas uh, at high pressures or at low pressures. Uh, this particular unit here, one thing I can show you guys that's, that I'm really proud of is I'm going to put this guy right here on the counter. This guy's a big old demo here. So what's really unique about our uh, Scotch Oak actuator is most of our competitors, uh, when you get into their actuators and you want to manually override a Scotch Oak actuator, the larger ones require a hydraulic override. Uh, typically, ours doesn't require a hydraulic override. And the difference is with their units, when you're trying to manually operate the actuator, you have to overcome the spring. So you're turning a hand wheel, or in this case, a hydraulic uh, override to actually compress the spring. So it's a lot of work to do it with something like a hand wheel. What we've actually done is we've designed, uh, we've designed a, a, a slip joint here, and this joint actually moves back and forth, and it allows us to declutch the spring or basically bypass the spring. So most of our units, you can actually operate even the largest ones using just a hand wheel. And in the case of this little guy over here, <coughs> this actuator here, if I get this thing going, you can see that I can actually take Literally, I got one finger on this hand wheel and I'm operating this butterfly valve 
down below with one finger. So it's it's a really unique feature uh, with our product that we that we built into the unit. Uh, again, it's basically a slip joint. So what this does is it pushes and pulls. Uh, this is the yoke block assembly, and it pushes and pulls that, and you don't have to worry about working against the spring. The spring stays where it is, and when you do uh, put air to the unit, the spring compresses and uh, drives a, a flat plate across here. So it actually just declutches this whole thing, and it moves back and forth. So it's a really neat feature. Uh, when customers, uh, especially engineers and engineering firms, when they're designing this stuff, you want to keep in mind what it is your operators have to deal with because after you design it, somebody else is going to own it. And if you build features like this into it, it makes it easier for an operator. It's also safer. You don't have to worry about a hydraulic system to maintain. And I'll just give you an example uh, since we have time. Right behind me is a, is a double acting actuator. Uh, and this is a hydraulic manual override. So essentially you have this hydraulic manual override. You got this handle. Uh, you got a reservoir full of hydraulic fluid, and you're having to sit here and pump this thing to manually stroke a valve. So a hand wheel is a lot easier, um, and that's why we designed that. Another thing that we do that's really unique, and I don't know if you guys, I think you guys can see it, is in our uh, Scotch yoke design here. Uh, this is a cutaway of it, and uh, we have a standard uh, roller bearing here, but encased around the roller bearing is actually a bronze bushing. That bronze uh, bushing is actually a, a considered a wear item or something that can handle the high cycles. It's field replaceable. What's really nice, though, is some of our competitor Scotch yoke actuators, they have a roller bearing, and that roller bearing rides directly on this yoke assembly right here. The problem is, is you have a flat surface in that of the yoke assembly, and then you have a round uh, roller bearing. Uh, very simple engineering, you have this round device that's rolling on a flat surface or rolling across it. What ends up happening is you have essentially the surface contact area of maybe the tip of this pen that's touching on here. What ends up happening in high cycle applications is this yoke will get wowled out. It'll, it'll basically just kind of bore, a, bore a, a shape into it and it'll wear itself out. That's why we put the bronze bushing in there. Uh, bronze is a soft metal. It allows it to, to be the wear, the wear component, and it allows you to replace that in the field. So all of our Scotch Oak actuators are rated to 2 million cycles or two years for our warranty. So we have a great warranty with it. Uh, we actually had one come back in uh, for inspection the other day. It had been in service uh, for seven years in an extremely high cycle application. It was constantly opening and closing. Uh, and much to our surprise, it was, it was in really excellent shape considering the application it had been in. So we have the ability to do that. Um, like I said, our actuators were designed uh, with, uh, with uh, the North Sea in mind or the North Slope uh, of Norway, which is a really treacherous, really difficult. It's cold. It's dirty. It's, it's a really tough environment to, to operate actuation in. So all of our stuff is designed around that. Uh, I talked about the linear actuators. Uh, this is a linear hydraulic cylinder. If it was direct gas, it would be the exact same cylinder, except it would be operating on uh, compressible gas. And then we also make them in uh, pneumatic as well. So we do spring return and we do uh, double acting. So you have fail safe or fail last. We make an electric actuator. Um, I think I have a picture of it here. <clears throat> we make uh, an electric actuator uh, here. This is a, a multi-turn electric actuator that we make. Uh, so these go on your multi-turn uh, gates, lobes, that type of valve. And then we also make a, a quarter-turn electric actuator here. Uh, so all these things, all these brochures and stuff are available um, on our website. Uh, the one thing that I'd love for people to take away from uh, this video and this presentation is really that we're not the biggest name in the industry, but we're the guys that are paying attention. And we're the guys that are listening to the customer we're giving people solutions. We're giving them competitive prices. We're giving them great deliveries. Um, we just want to be the manufacturer that people want to do business with. And, and I've always wanted people to want to do business with me, not feel like they had to. And, and to come in and take over a business where they're already operating like that, it was one of the simplest transitions I've ever made uh, to come in and operate a business where they, they already believe in those principles that I believe in. So. Um, you know, that being said, I, David, how are we looking on time? 
Uh, time's looking pretty good. We did have one other question come in. Yes, sir. And that was just uh, a question about uh, your field service policy. Uh, but did you yes, want to just run quickly through? Yeah, actually what I could do is I could probably share my screen for just a moment. Uh, let's see if I can share the correct one here. What I'm going to do is this is just a quick presentation. So um, one of the things I could show you guys, I'll go back to it here in just a moment, but uh, this is the field service. So this is actually a picture of our, our field service truck. Uh, as far as field service goes, uh, we offer field service on everything that we manufacture. Uh, in fact, I made the decision uh, when this COVID thing uh, hit that we would start offering startup and commissioning on our on projects and to me the definition of a project in my mind is anything of a hundred thousand dollars or more roughly and that and that's really my discretion uh, but we're going to start offering startup and commissioning no charge to the end user uh, we have the ability that service truck you see there in the picture it lifts 7500 pounds it has 30 foot reach it has four-wheel drive we have an onboard miller welder 11,000 watt generator uh, high pressure uh, air system with auxiliary tanks, uh, self leveling system, wireless crane control. Uh, we actually can go out, we work with, through resale and distribution, and we can actually go out and work alongside our resale and distribution partners as well as OEM valve manufacturers. And we can go out and commission a project for them, for their end user, for their customer. So we do offer that. We have standard rates, which would be if we were performing the job for the end user. And what I've also went out and done is developed resale rates. I want our resellers and distributors to have the ability to utilize our service, but I also want them to be able to make money on it and be part of it. So what we've done is I've given special uh, resale rates to our resale and distribution partners where they can schedule it with their customer and then Paladon will come out and partner with them and then they can make money on it as well. I hope that answers the question. Right, cool. Thanks very much. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so that's, that's everything that we have. I want to uh, definitely thank you for a fantastic presentation um, and taking the time to join us today. So we do really appreciate that. Um, I'm just going to uh, grab the screen there to uh, tell some folks what's coming up next. Okay. All right. So um, as you know, the Automation Village breakout sessions, we've got uh, three streams going on that are all running simultaneously. Uh, we've got a utility stream, a reporting and analytics stream, and right now you're in the cybersecurity and general automation stream. Um, next up in each of the streams uh, in the utilities, we've got Kennedy Industries talking about uh, MDOT, which is uh, the Michigan Department of Transportation. That's a, a cloud hosted application uh, that was done by Kennedy. Um, we've got predictably in the reporting stream, a, a some information on reporting by ERIS. And um, in this stream up next, we're going to have uh, GuidePoint. So we've got Nick Croucher coming up from uh, GuidePoint Security, and he's going to be talking about uh, you know security and automation and this kind of thing. So this will be happening um, at the top of the hour. So we're going to take roughly a 10 minute break. Uh, so you can stretch your legs, grab a coffee, uh, do whatever. Um, so please join us uh, again at the, the top of the hour. I believe that's uh, 12 o'clock Eastern and, uh, and we'll get going with uh, Nick's presentation there. So I hope to see everybody soon. Um, I have a great break guys. We'll chat again shortly. So in the meantime, I'm just going to put on a, uh, a Rolodex of, of slides and we'll come back online before long. All right, everybody. And we are back. So as noted earlier, um, you guys are watching the uh, cybersecurity and general automation, automation village uh, stream. And next up, we're gonna have a presentation from Nick Croucher of GuidePoint Security. So uh, Nick, if you're on the line there, uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and, and come into the conversation. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. So how are, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. How are you? Good. Yeah, I'm doing very well. Um, yeah, so I hopefully uh, hopefully we'll get everything uh, get everything going. And uh, I'm just gonna before we start, the way that the presentation is gonna work is Nick's gonna talk to us for roughly 40 minutes, 
Um, and during that time, if you have questions, then you can click into the Q&A box that you'll see uh, on the share there. Uh, you should see that in your little Zoom dialog. Um, there you can enter your question. And after the end, at the end of the presentation, um, so roughly 40 minutes after the hour, uh, we'll go through those with Nick and he'll be able to answer the questions that you've entered and any questions that you come up with during that period. Uh, so like I say, so if you want to put in a question, just drop it in there and we'll get to it then. Um, again, this is the um, cybersecurity general animation stream. If uh, it's not where you want to be, then check back to the invitation and you'll see the different invites to the different streams there. But this uh, presentation with Nick should be really interesting. Like I say, it's about cybersecurity, probably one of the hottest topics that we um, have happening in the world right now, especially in the uh, different industries where we see so much automation. So if you want, Nick, feel free to uh, put your screen up and uh, sort of introduce yourself and what you're going to talk about today and, and start to take things away. Okay. Um... All right, everyone see my screen? Yep. Excellent. All right, well, welcome everyone uh, to this cybersecurity breakout session um, on security orchestration, automation, and response. My name is Nick Croucher, connecting in on a very rainy day here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. <clears throat> uh, I'm a senior security architect for GuidePoint Security. And if you're here to learn more about security orchestration and automation, you're in the right place. So to start off, um, let me tell you a little bit about GuidePoint Security. So we're a cybersecurity company providing services to over 2,000 customers in any area of cybersecurity. We work with over 350 vendors to provide the best resources for your cybersecurity needs. Um, at GuidePoint Security, we hire and keep the best and the brightest in the cybersecurity industry. Um, you know, we work with emerging threats to regulatory mandates. Um, our cybersecurity engineers are, and consultants and architects will work side by side with your organization uh, to provide a complete understanding of your current threat landscape. And we help you to implement the best technical and procedural solutions to achieve your business goals and objectives, um, certainly to keep you safe. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about a relatively new tool um, available in the security world. Security Orchestration Automation and Response, or SOAR, is generating a lot of interest in the marketplace today. It provides a lot of automation for remedial tasks and solves several problems in your security operations center. So Security Automation, or SOAR, uh, it's an aptly appointed acronym, actually. Um, as someone with experience as an analyst, such as myself, in managing a security operations center, when I hear the word SOAR, I think of the words congruence and efficiency. Uh, these are words I'm sure every C-level executive at any organization expects from their security operations centers. Um, this is a definition I'm providing you here from Gartner. Uh, SOAR refers to technologies that enable organizations to collect inputs monitored by the security operations team. For example, alerts from the SIM system and other security technologies where incident analysis and triage can be performed by leveraging a combination of human and machine power help define, prioritize, and drive standardiz standardized incident response activities. So, SOAR tools allow an organization to define incident and analysis and response procedures in a digital workflow format. Uh, that sounds certainly, you know, pretty. it's a pretty good overview for me, but, you know, we're going to dig a little bit deeper today and give you some more information about what a SOAR can provide for your operations center. But before I venture into the SOAR, uh, I'd like to start with laying the groundwork for where we are today and why we'd even consider a relatively new market offering like SOAR. As we move forward, I'd like to uh, I'd like you to look uh, to the big picture for now. Even though it may be understood, I believe it's worth in overstating when there's the cohesive flow in detection and response, it leads to quick and efficient remediation. Um, your organization is more likely to prevent a data breach. There's certainly a change in today's cybersecurity climate as we deal with a pandemic 
Uh, it's a paradigm shift in thinking and working and bringing uh, forward a new uh, notion of threat. And it's important to stay ahead of them. These new threats, uh, to keep your sock on their toes uh, as they aim to defend from adversaries taking advantage of this new threat landscape. As we all now work remotely to accomplish our daily tasks, keep in mind this new paradigm we are now living in. Um, uninvited adversaries want, can, and will find ample opportunity to stay undetected for as long as possible when analysts such as myself are dealing with a multitude of alerts, sifting through false positives and deciding which alert is more worthwhile than the next to follow up on. I have been involved in security operations, the daily grind of investigating alert after alert. Um, don't get me wrong, you know, it was a lot of fun tracking down some of these adversaries, you know, just hunting down different behaviors and nefarious activity. Um, but, you know, it becomes a lot of pressure. Um, you know, the pressure we put ourselves on as analysts was just the sheer amount of alerts that we're investigating. Um, you know, in 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 any given day, we're looking at thousands of alerts, um, which is one more important reason why uh, SOAR is a is a good component to consider. Uh, after a while, um, being in a role where I managed a SOC environment, it took a considerable amount of time and effort. Now, SIM tools are great, um, and they can correlate raw logs from systems like firewalls and proxies and antivirus protection. Um, most of my experience as a cybersecurity professional comes in the world of uh, security incident and event monitoring, which is a SIM. Um, a SIM will provide you with alerts to further investigate your, you know, your decisions and things like that. But, you know, but what a SIM does, you know, get, you know, with these alerts, I'm looking at all these alerts and I'm like, well, there's alert number 3,221. And what makes it more important than alert number 2,621? And, you know, just going back and forth and figuring out exactly which one, which data that I'm looking at is more important to follow through on. Which one of these is going to be the breach that, that gets, gets our company in trouble? Now, I know there are ways to stipulate which alerts are more important than others. Um, for example, malware alerts on a domain controller or a DNS server that, you know, they may have my higher priority than malware alerts on a common workstation. You know, I get that. But it takes a considerable amount of time to sift through and make a decision as to what's important and what's not, um, you know, and what's not important. When there are so many alerts to respond to, it's just, you know, overwhelming sometimes. Um, so I'm also going to talk about the attack kill chain, which I'll mention here in a few minutes. Um, this is relevant to the conversation, certainly. Um, what there is to say here is that the bad guys want to stay hidden. So alerts being generated that are of low and medium severity can be just as important. So which ones do we respond to? Um, sometimes even these low and mediums are, are even more critical than, than the ones that we see uh, in red. Um, when you see a higher critical alert, it's likely that something's present in your environment for quite some time. Um, and that's what we'll take a look at here in, in a few minutes. So moving on to, um, you may be familiar or have heard of the acronym APT or Advanced Persistent Threat. So I just wanted to clarify what that is. Um, is APT, you know, it's, uh, it's basically proof that your bad guys want to stay hidden. Um, and I took these definitions from the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain. Um, when you look at advanced, obviously targeted, coordinated, and purposeful. Persistent, fairly obvious. They're in there week after week, month after month. You know, I've battled APTs in my previous experience, and you talk about whack-a-mole, you're going from one, um, you know, you see one alert, you kill that weed, it shows three show up the next day. And you're basically chasing down to make sure that you're, organization is protected and then obviously threat which is self-explanatory per persons with intent opportunity and capability so back to alert severity 
when the high and critical alerts hit, if it's not a false positive, chances are the fire has been lit. And it's time to call the fire department. <laughs> now, granted, this is a hypothetical situation, and I mentioned it to a point to point out some of the pain points experienced in today's security operations center. Um, so let me just click this here real quick. So attackers time to compromise. So this is a key vector that is referred to often when it comes to security operations. Attackers time to compromise versus enterprise time to respond. So let me let me just break down this phrase here for you. So the keyword here in this phrase is time. Time is the key motivator to any form of orchestration and automation. And the word time has many different masks. For example, it's save time. I'm borrowing time. I don't want to waste your time. Investing time, time and effort. Sometimes in meetings, you you may have heard the host saying, "I'll give you 10 minutes back of your you know to your day," as they're as they're ending the meeting early. So, time is always relative to to the situation in operations. The point I want to make here is that time is is you know is a SOC's best and worst enemy. Um, with SOAR. The general goal is to capitalize on your time. Um, so let's further down, let's further break down this phrase here with the words compromise, right? So compromise versus respond. First, compromise in today's threat landscape, compromise would mean many things. So you dig a little deeper, I'd like to bring your attention to a framework called the cyber kill chain, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes referred to as the attack life cycle. So just got a slide here for you to take a look and see what this attack life cycle may look like. Now these are essentially just different steps in, um, you know, in, in that any, as for example, malware, any steps that a malware would take, you know, it gets to that point where it becomes malware, but there's, it starts out with reconnaissance. Reconnaissance, you're harvesting email addresses, for example, uh, you, you're getting information and those reconnaissance steps um, those are the ones that are going to be um, those low-level medium alerts. This, uh, like I said, this framework was developed by Lockheed Martin as part of a registered model they call the intelligence-driven defense. Um, the attack lifecycle is a, it's a methodology that maps out stages of nefarious behaviors into a sequence of events that help us identify all intentions. Um, or back to our word compromise, right? Um, by identifying these sequence of events, um, at each stage of the attack is performed, gives your organization the ability to tell how far along and what level the enterprise is compromised. Now, to bring this conversation back to our medium and low alerts again, um, while looking at the cyber kill chain, can you see that some of these medium or low alerts could map to an early stage of the cyber kill chain? So like a reconnaissance, reconnaissance or weaponization may not show up as a critical alert. Um, when you're talking about critical alerts, you're most likely looking at installation where malware is actually being installed or your command and control, um, and then even worse, um, actions on objectives where they accomplish the goal. And that's where, where a breach comes in. Um, move on here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back to the word respond. Uh, as we further break down this relative phrase, um, so this is the e this is the easiest one to explain, um, and sometimes the hardest to follow through on, identifying where on that kill chain the behavior fits gives a SOC a more efficient way to respond, thereby saving time. And we're going back to our word time. So. Efficiency and time can be uh, the savior for, uh, for all security investigations. Uh, the quicker we detect the malicious activity, the quicker we can respond and re remediate. Simple. From my experience, um, I can say that time is likely m the most valuable commodities, one of the most valuable commodities in all of the operations aspect. The ultimate goal to your SOC is to limit the time to compromise, as well as the, the, to limit the time to respond. Um, SOAR, um, then, you know, it's it's the tool that can stand up to this challenge and provide much needed respite for your for your SOC. Um, at a high level, SOAR solves four problems, and we'll go through that here real quick <clears throat> um, as we dig a little deeper.
perfect. Make sure we're on the right track. So <laughs> I think I mentioned this, alerts, alerts, and more alerts. Um, so the three factors you I want to talk about. So false positives, it's any organization, the larger, organ the larger your enterprise, the more likelihood there is of false positives. And that, um, you know, from my experience, some of the larger enterprise that we've had, that I've worked in, um, you know, we're talking globally, you're getting in firewall logs from, you know, 300, 400, up to thousands of different locations. Um, and firewalls are pretty chatty. So there are, there's a good chance you're going to have false positives. Um, time is on my side, says no analyst ever. I put time is on my side in quotes here as a reference to the, um, to the Rolling Stone song. You guys might be familiar with that. <clears throat> um, and then there's a, and then there's alert fatigue. So this is an interesting concept driven merely by embracing who we are as human beings. So alert fatigue, it's essentially your desensitization to alerts and alarms. We get so many alerts that they eventually all just blend in and they, uh, and they lose their significance. So taken straight from Wikipedia on the subject, desensitization can lead to longer response times or missing important alarms. Now, there's our word again, time. All right, so then we've got the the uh, the problem of uh, disparity in, in, in security tools. So a day in the life of the SOC analyst involves investigating alerts. We know this, right? We've talked about it. What this means is, let's say uh, Susie, as an analyst, gets an alert in the console. Uh, let's say a device is seen to be using Nmap, which is an application for reconnaissance. Then the analyst pivots into their endpoint detection tool. Uh, to see if there are any malware alerts. Then she pivots back into the sim to check the firewall logs. Of course, there are tons of firewall logs because they're very chatty. So it becomes a hot minute to retrieve all of them. And she hones in on the time and the activity was seen and still was across a file. And she checks virus total to see if the hash is known, in, you know, known as a malicious file, if it's indicated as a, you know, as, as, a, as a bad actor, and determining... Then she jumps back into her endpoint detection screen, quarantines the file, you know, and meanwhile, all of this took like 30 minutes for one alert. And, um, you know, just over time, I think from my experience, any typical analyst can most can, can do a full investigation on about five to 10 alerts per day. And, you know, sometimes we're seeing thousands. So, Moving on here. All right, so decentralization of uh, procedures and guidelines. Now, from a SOC perspective, uh, procedures, policies, guidelines, standards, all of that stuff needs to, you know, needs to be uh, integrated flawlessly in a security operation center. It is probably the foundation, the core of everything that we need. Um, Following a procedure to remediate, for example, you know, following a procedure to investigate, who to contact, knowing how much time is needed to complete the task. Um, to be most effective, all these policies, procedures, documentations, guidelines, contacts, standards, they all need to be centralized, accessible uh, and searchable, um, and, and accessible and searchable all in one place. You know, that way everyone knows where to get the information. Um, another important aspect is metrics, right? So metrics and reporting. Um, I've worked at companies where all the information is stored in spreadsheets and CSV files, and uh, that's certainly not efficient. Um, but it happens. I mean, this is it's understandable. That's that's how you know that's that's how things work these days. Um, and it's and it's not uncommon to see lots of information stored on spreadsheets on different file shares. Um, but we want to be able to see these metrics quickly and easily. We want to know where to get them. We want to be able to see these trends and monitor performance. We want to report on the activities viewed on regular intervals to help us see the big picture and identify aspects that can be tuned and tweaked or enhance our efficiency. Um, 
it's an important aspect of, of security operations. Um, and it's sometimes overlooked, you know, metrics and, and, and reporting. But uh, what SOAR does, it provides a centralized location to monitor and control and audit um, and easily improve on these policies. Um, so this can also be done with playbooks and dashboards and reporting, and I'll get into that here in a second. All right, so missing talent. So you're, you know, um, I think in the industry these days, this is something that's fairly, fairly common. Um, you know, there's, uh, I think I mentioned that Security Magazine predicts 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs will go unfilled by 2021, right, in the private sector. You know, that's, that's, that's quite alarming. So we'll say there's there's more training opportunities out there available nowadays. Um, I've actually seen a lot. So if you're interested in cybersecurity, um, a lot of folks or a lot of institutions are offering free training or discounted training. Um, you know, certainly we could use the talent in the cybersecurity field. Um, but the other aspect of this is, you know, your your cybersecurity analysts are now wearing multiple hats. So at any given moment, there were times when you know, I'd have to upgrade the, the SIM and check out some of the problems that we're having in some of the other hardware appliances around the world. And I'd be working as an engineer wearing my engineer hat. And then I'd be notified that there's an alarm, an alert that needs to be investigated. And I jump to my analyst hat. And then I'd be handling a project to deploy agents in a certain area of the uh, of the company and I'd be wearing my project management hat. So a lot of times we're, you know, in cybersecurity, we're just, we're basically filling gaps where we need to. And, you know, and it, and that's where the, one of the problems that SOAR can, can solve for us um, is to really alleviate the, the, the fact that we have missing talent. <clears throat> so I'm going to move on here. Um, all right, so how do we do this? Um, so I talk, I'm going to talk about playbooks. So playbooks, um, essentially, it's an, it's an outline or your workflow for alerting or even reporting and remediation. So it starts with a triggering event. Um, for example, an alert for malicious behavior detected can be a trigger or an email, a phishing email successfully lands into an end user's inbox. You know, that can be a triggering event. Um, and then from that step, you can map out the flow for how this would typically be investigated and remediated in your SOC. Um, there's actually a website called draw.io. Um, if you go to that website, it actually provides a really cool tool. It's free um, to create your workflow and playbook. So um, you can create your triggering ev event, your triggering moment, you know, can, and then actually you can automate each step as you go along your path. So once you've created your playbook, Step one, step two, step three. You can have if, if then statements um, and or statements. And then once you've created that playbook, you can then import that into your uh, SOAR tool and, uh, and actually automate all of those. And, and um, you know, I think that's a, that's a huge time saver, certainly. Um, and like I said, you know, could, you could automate that um, based on the, you know, based on your procedures that you've created for yourself. Um, one example I think is, is really neat is being able to automate regular status reports. So as a SOC manager, you know, I want to know what's going on right now, right? So there's an investigation going on. I want to be able to answer the questions. And then my CISO's, my CISO's knocking on my door and he's saying, hey, uh, what's the status on this investigation? So by generating a playbook with the metrics on any given incident, I could automate a status report and add whatever criteria I deem necessary after each stage of the investigation. So I know what the current status is up to the minute and report out to it uh, as needed. So streamlined um, incident response investigating. So by ingesting all the information into one place, um, as an analyst, you know, I don't have to go searching for all the relevant information I need. So with, um, with ingestion and integration, so ingestion, I'm basically bringing in all the information, and and essentially, uh, this works the sim with all the the raw logs. You can bring that information into your SOAR tool, so you have one place to actually have that information, and then your integration 
is basically, uh, I'll give you an example. If you, if you integrate with your Active Directory, you can then see anything associated with usernames, um, with email addresses. You can see when users are logging in or logging off or when they're failing to log in and log off, where they're logging in from, that kind of thing. Um, so integrations uh, available in your stores is really important as well. But I think the, the best part of it is your enrichment with, um, with threat intelligence um, to know exactly. So if you see a file in your investigation, you've already enriched that with threat intelligence. So you can, you'll know immediately whether that file is malicious or not if you're doing your investigation. So that's, that's really handy. Um, so metrics are important, um, not just any metrics, you know, metrics that provide details on the maturity level of your SOC. So as with any aspects of IT, there's always a need for continuing improvement. Um, you know, management, upper management, and executives at your company, that, they want to know what your, how your SOC is faring. You know, are we, are we protected? How are we, how are we maintaining our visibility on threats? How can we improve? Um, you know, that's a question that comes up quite often is, is with SOAR, you know, can we answer this? Can we automate this? Can we tweak this response based on the details of the request? So I think monitoring trends and, and creating learning opportunities as well for our analysts is, is a very important aspect. And again, it can be automated. Um, so this is my favorite aspects of SOAR. Um, a single place to get all the information done on one platform. So this reminds me of a time when I was really into building my own computers and stuff. And, you know, it's about d decades ago and I'd have computer parts all over the house, you know, I'll have some in the garage and, you know, s some in the living room table and things like that. So I'd start building an awesome gaming machine, install a motherboard into the case and insert the processor and the glue and everything. And then putting the hard drive in and I'm like, Oh no, where's that IDE cable? So, um, you know, just a basic analogy to emphasize that you have all the information you need right there on one screen. Um, you don't need to go anywhere else and you can actually um, really streamline your, your investigations. Um, and I think part of the, the benefits here is pretty self-explanatory and, and I'll go th through them quickly. I think we're, we're kind of reaching our time. Um, but um, so you analyze productivity, essentially you're, you're able to re automate um, remedial tasks. And by remedial tasks, I mean, oh, we got another phishing email. We got another phishing email. Oh, we got another phishing email. Well, you can automate how to actually um, any part of that investigation. And I think a lot of times what we'd have to do is we'd have to disable a user's account because their password was compromised, you know, and you can actually automate the disabling of the account if you detect password that was compromised. So, um, you know, that, that saves a lot of time. Um, and then you've got your audit trail, you know, if you need to present, um, you know, if you do, Auditing for proficiency is obviously one that comes to mind when I think about how um, analysts, you know, they, you know, we're, we're human beings, you know, they may take a, take a misstep and go a different direction than what they may have. We can go back to the audit log and say, hey, in this situation, you know, this is a better approach. This is, and it provides a, a training, a learning opportunity. Um, certainly faster response times, you know, uh, efficacy so you know which threats to address first you know you've got 10 on your screen you know that number one and number seven are the ones that you need to look at right now and um and you can even automate that so this you streamline your remedial incidents like i've like i've been saying and then and obviously this is you know this is increased efficiency it's en enriching your data is really important uh and to be able to see exactly what you want at any given moment is uh, is really useful. <clears throat> um, we talked about this as a problem. Obviously, you're going to decrease your volume of alerts, and, and you're going to eliminate the uh, the alert fatigue that I talked about. Um, and you can you you know when your SOC is working, you're only working on the actionable alerts. Um, and then again, I think I mentioned um, 
reporting as well, metrics, uh, things that are pretty important in, um, in maintaining your SOC. So I don't have to rush through there towards the end um, to make sure that, that uh, and I apologize for the, for the mic glitching out there, but um, just wanna touch on some things here. So I think overall, based on what I'm talking about, we can decrease the level of effort in your in your socks. So by decreasing that level of effort, you're reducing your overall risk and your security operation center being your the component um, that's front and center monitoring any possible threat in your environment. You want to make sure that that um, operation works efficiently. Now in this um, in this space, you know, SOAR being a, a really hot topic right now, there's a, there's a lot of tool, uh, SIM tools that are integrating SOAR as a capability and a product offering. So that's um, that's a new uh, it's a new way to to look to look at these things. Um, you know, SIM, and then maybe they may have a light SOAR with some automation. Um, so that's that's something to to consider when you're you know if you're looking at a SOAR tool. Um, but certainly SOAR is gaining uh, a lot of visibility in the sector, and uh, it's probably what prompted me to to talk on it today. Um, so I think this is a Gartner uh, study here. So five percent of companies are using the product today. You know, certainly not a huge percentage, but by 2021, you know, we're going to increase this. Uh, there's going to be an increase of SOAR uh, needs uh, by 25 percent by next year. So uh, there's a lot of companies in the space. I don't want to, you know, mention any names or anything, but um, you can certainly reach out if you have any questions on what SOAR tools are out there and available. So uh, <clears throat> that concludes the, uh, the, the presentation. Um, I appreciate your time. And again, I apologize for the glitch in the microphone. Yeah, no problem at all, Nick. Uh, that was really great. So I appreciate you taking the time to uh, educate everybody about uh, what SOAR is. So right off the bat, um, why don't you tell us a little bit, so how does, I mean, for somebody who's listening to this who says, you know, I really like what this is all about. I was, you know, the, the concept of SOAR um, was something that I really, I really think is good. Um, tell us about how GuidePoint Security um, and SOAR, how do you guys kind of tie that together or or what does it look like for a customer who who feels they're interested do they reach out straight to you and and how does that kind of flow on yeah they can certainly reach out to me or and you know we so we have you know we have uh, different regions and different resources available for different cybersecurity tasks and needs but um i my you know my personal experience in in the store world i'll probably you know meet with a customer and we'd have a conversation about what the environment looks like right now. You know, we'll assess, you know, what, what their needs are and which direction they want to go. What are some of their pain points? How can we address some of the issues that, you know, that they want to really have solved when it comes to security and, um, and SOAR could possibly be um, something that can assist them in getting better leverage and handling the amount of alerts that they may have. Right. Okay. And a, and a quick one here is, um, so is GuidePoint um, doing the, the education and the, the planning as sort of like a, a consultant role? Or are you guys uh, actually um, more like a contractor where you're taking on the role of uh, doing the monitoring and, and other things? Actually, we can do both. So it depends on what the customer needs. You know, we can cater the service to whatever uh, you know, it, the customer may need. So there are, there, there, we have customers where, you know, they meet, they need uh, staff augmentation. They need someone on site or remotely to help them, to help them to do a specific task, whether it's, you know, SOAR related. And we talk about SOAR, you know, as an example, I'd be, I'll be assisting a customer and I'd go hands on and, and help them develop a plan to get to where they need to be. You know, and then there's also, you know, um, we can make recommendations on what the different products are. You know, there's, I think if I look, took a list, took a look at the list yesterday, there's about 10 different, 10 or more different SOAR vendors out there. 
um, you know, we can provide recommendations on based on our experience on the product. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And and how do you guys work with some of the different um, industrial standards that are out there for, say, a customer who's maybe in the power industry versus someone who's in the water industry or somebody's in pharmaceuticals and where they have some other um, other standards that sort of uh, give them guidelines on on expectations regarding their networking and other things. Yeah, so there's, you know, we, we have um, people skilled in all the regulatory capacities um, that that will be able to help out in any level of, um, and so, you know, I, you said pharmaceuticals, let's talk about that real quick. So, you know, HIPAA being a, a major compliance, regulatory compliance piece, you know, there's a lot of advice, you know, we can, GuidePoint can provide a, assistance in an advisory capacity, take a look at where they're at right now, provide regulatory, you know, recommendations. Um, I know that there's quite a few, <laughs> there's quite a few out there um, and we do have experts in each area. Right. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to pop up the, um, the slide here that shows um, for anybody looking to ask a question, you can uh, click on the little Q and a uh, button there that you'll see inside of your, your zoom window. And uh, you can enter the question there. It'll pop up on my console, and uh, I'll be able to uh, to ask that to Nick or have that discussion. So, um, Nick, is there anything else then? I guess what's a, what's kind of a normal uh, lead time for somebody if they reach out to you? I mean, should they expect that um, by the time you guys are, are back and forth and you have a strategy strategy in place, is this something that normally happens in a matter of weeks, months, or is it kind of like a you know a, a year or two? To um, to kind of have that strategy worked out where you're you've got something that their uh, works for them I guess they're comfortable with. Yeah, that's a that's a good question actually. So um, you know it does depend on the organization, um, and I think you know if I speak from experience, when when the pandemic shifted to the point where we had a lot of workers needing to work remotely, there were a lot of customers that we ran into that needed assistance in getting something deployed fast, you know, VPN and provide protection from a remote standpoint, you know, and we, you know, we would jump in and we'd have, we draft the, the project guidelines and we jump in and take care of it pretty quickly, probably within two to four weeks. When we're talking about a SOAR product, mm -hmm. um, you know, GuidePoint would probably step in there. I'd step in there. I'll talk for myself. I'd step in there and not, I'd get, I'd evaluate where there are, um, we'd scope it all out. And once a, a sore product is purchased, I would say anywhere between two to six weeks, depending on the size of the corporation, um, we'd be able to tune and develop everything, all their playbooks and everything that they require uh, to automate some of their processes. So they should be up and running between two to six weeks. Right. And how big of an organization would you recommend really should be um, putting some effort into these uh, SOAR practices? Yeah, um, it's sort of hard to say, right? So it all depends on, it depends on several factors. So you've got, um, I would say, depending on how many tools you already have from a cybersecurity standpoint, if you're, if you have an endpoint detection tool and you have a network detection tool and depending on how many tools you have, and how much time and effort that you're spending on these tools is probably going to be more uh, that I would gauge based on the actual size of the company. Um, you know, but I think some of the larger companies, uh, probably 500 plus are going to have more tools, you know, and the more tools you have, the more you'd want to save time and actually automate some of those processes. Right. Right. No, that's perfect. Thanks very much. Um, so is there, is there anything else that you wanted to, uh, to, to sort of close out on, um, before we sort of move into what's happening next? Uh, no, but I do appreciate the, uh, the time, uh, to, to, to share my insights into, into SOAR and operations. And, um, uh, certainly if anyone has any questions or that come up later down the line, feel free to get in touch with me. Right. Perfect. Yeah. And we want to thank you, of course, for joining us uh, at the Automation Village here. Uh, we appreciated uh, what you did at the trade show and then expanding on that and really sharing your knowledge with, uh, with the bigger audience um, is really fantastic. So 
again, thanks very much for your time. And uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll hear from you again in the future. Great. So thank you, Dave. You're very welcome. Thank you. So right now, as you guys are probably aware, you're w watching the cybersecurity and general automation stream, for the automation village. Um, today's our breakout session. So we're seeing uh, longer presentations, about 40 minutes each with a Q&A period, as opposed to our trade show, which is more presentations over a very um, streamlined section. It's sort of 10 minute bits. Um, right now, this is the cybersecurity and general automation stream, which is one of three streams going on. We also have a utility stream and a reports and analytics stream, which are going on currently. So if you look at the invite, there'll be three links, um, one to each stream. And if you uh, are looking to change streams, the easiest thing to do is to close out of the stream you're in, go back to the invite, and then click to open the next stream, as opposed to just clicking the invite and trying to jump from one to the other. Uh, occasionally, Zoom uh, has uh, some, some alerts that get hidden in the background when you try to do that. So next up, and this will be our final presentations of the day, um, we've got EMA talking about uh, the high performance HMI, and that's going to be in the utilities stream. In the reports and analytics stream, we've got SciTech talking about um, Excel workbooks and responsive web reports. And in the security and automation stream, this stream, we've got SEL coming up to talk about um, another thing about uh, security. We talk about securing critical infrastructure. So that'll be uh, Dennis Gamble. And that presentation will be starting in roughly 10 minutes. So right at the top of the hour, uh, we'll come back online. We'll bring Dennis on and he'll be speaking for roughly 40 minutes. You'll, and then you'll have a chance to um, go through some of your questions and other things and have a bit of a discussion with Dennis there uh, before we end for the day. So I'm gonna bring the slideshow back into our, our lobby as we call it, sort of the Rolodex of slides. And we'll see you again in roughly 10 minutes. So thanks very much everybody for joining in. Uh, we will see you shortly. All right, and we're back. So coming up next, we'll have Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories talking about securing critical infrastructure, and that's a presentation which will be done by Dennis Gamble. So uh, this is gonna be our last presentation for the day. Right now you're watching the cybersecurity and general automation stream. And um, as I said, this is the Automation Village. So during the presentation, if you have any questions, there's a little QA box uh, down in the bottom of your, your Zoom window there. Um, just open that up, type in the question that you wanna ask, and then that will come up on my dashboard. And from there, you'll be able to, um, at the end of the presentation, I'll ask Dennis those different questions. We'll have a bit of a discussion. If you have follow-up or anything else, and you can just put them right back in that QA window and they'll come up right on my dashboard and we'll keep going through those. So Dennis, uh, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you well. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. So, and uh, and how are things where you are? Is it starting to, I don't know, uh, I'm in a little colder climate, but it's really starting to look like summer where I am. So it's uh, pretty encouraging to see that today. Yes, actually, the, the weather's getting better here as well. We're up here in the Northwest, uh, Pullman, Washington, just south of Spokane, Washington, right. where I'm located. Right. Ah, very cool. That's a nice area. So hopefully it doesn't look like your your first slide there. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. With the lightning, yeah, we do do have to deal with that from time to time, though. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, yeah, if you want, feel free to um, kind of introduce what you're going to be talking about today. And um, you know, basically start taking things away with your slide. And uh, for anybody watching, it'll be about forty minutes of the presentation, and uh, and then we'll put aside um, some time afterward to answer the questions. Um, and where this is the last presentation, uh, we don't have really a, a hard time limit on it, but uh, usually it's about uh, ten minutes to to run through the questions there. So go ahead, there, Dennis. Hey, Dave. Um, Dennis Gamble with Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories. I, I've been with the company for 15 years. Uh, prior to SEL, I uh, have been doing a lot of work in uh, cybersecurity, uh, specifically on uh, Linux-based systems, uh, doing some clustering of uh, Linux systems for, um, for solutions in, in uh, different corporate networks. And uh, I joined SEL because of that Linux background. They needed some help uh, looking at 
uh, a new set of devices, which I'll talk about here in a little bit at the time, uh, back in 2005, um, for uh, using an embedded Linux uh, operating system at the time. So I spoke last week uh, for about 10 minutes, giving a little bit of an in introduction to some of the things that I'll be talking about today. Um, when SEL was founded, uh, we primarily sold devices to electric utilities. Uh, but as our pr product portfolio grew, so did the number of industries we partnered with. Uh, SEL now designs and manufactures solutions for a variety of industries, including pulp and paper, transportation, water, wastewater, healthcare, government, mission critical facilities, oil and gas. Our customers uh, face challenges ranging from, from how to integrate renewable energy sources to the power grid to uh, how to provide uh, perfectly reliable power in hospitals, uh, research facilities as well. Um, our products are the brains behind many of the systems that address these challenges in a way that is uh, both cost effective and improves uh, safety. Today, um, I'm going to talk primarily about cybersecurity solutions. I started out with the company, uh, like I said, looking at it embedded devices. Um, but at, um, my whole career at, at SEL has been about uh, cybersecurity. And uh, now we have a new focus uh, group that uh, actually looks at cybersecurity for control systems specifically, even though we've been doing it for uh, ever since the founding of the company. From a philosophy, from a philosophy perspective uh, in cybersecurity, um, we, we take a look at cybersecurity from a defense in depth approach, especially for these distributed control systems. Um, this is a model that uh, we, we kind of work from uh, it's meant to provide uh, layers of, of um, demarcation uh, as well as separation of duty and application between devices. And it's really about leveraging all the devices in the distributed control system from a cybersecurity perspective. So even though they, many of them will have their primary purpose, we can also use them for other purposes for uh, make, making sure that the, the system overall is, is secure from a cyber perspective. And this is really about um, creating hurdles, if you will, um, to basically uh, prevent the, the malicious actor or the unwanted threat in the system uh, from, from being able to attack directly in an efficient manner. Uh, we're able, with this type of defense in depth approach, we're able to uh, monitor different aspects of the system as well as uh, decrease their ability to pivot inside the system. And the idea is that we're able to capture them. Here's an example of, uh, of us using this model, if you will. Uh, so we don't just use the model for teaching. Uh, we also use it in our system designs as well. And I'm not going to go through uh, the system itself, but just kind of show you that really the levels themselves, uh, we, can, we do all sorts of things with them. We not only provide some sort of isolation, if you will, of the different types of products maybe physically inside the system, but also from an application perspective. And we also apply different types of security controls to the systems based on uh, the different levels as well. We, we do separation of human to machine as well as uh, protection of machine to machine communications. And we categorize those communications typically between SCADA, engineering access or control and then we apply different rules to those to those communications inside the system i started off with a company uh inside a group called computing systems uh the sel was developing a computer at the time and like i said i was i was kind of more focused on the the linux based operating system um, i've learned a lot though here at sel especially from an embedded device perspective uh, control systems um, and workstation computers in, in those control systems have, from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, challenges. Uh, one of those challenges is just maintaining and keeping, up, keeping them up to date. One of the things that we did was we took a look at the computer and the kind of applications we were using uh, in the control system with those computers. And we really wanted to essentially offload having to use a computer and move some of those automated type functions onto a new type of platform. This platform that we developed is very similar to a programmable logic controller, a PLC. Uh, we, call, we call it the re, uh, real-time automation controller. Uh, we've, we, we have several different uh, hardware platforms that uh, 
this solution runs on. And this is really to provide the customer with a variety of ways to apply the types of um, to apply the types of applications that this type of product serves. In this picture, you'll see that we have it with a IO control. We have um, a, a 3U rack mount device that has a plethora of serial ports on the back of it. And really, the idea is to be able to serve all sorts of different applications. And in that model I had, this type of product, along with the applications, are typically uh, layer two type of applications where the layer one type of applications in my model were really kind of the core assets, the IEDs and the controllers, if you will. So this device already kind of comes with many of the types of security um, capabilities and functions that you're used to in typical IT infrastructure. Um, it has the ability to, to handle users on the system with role-based access control. Um, it has a, even though it's embedded, uh, it has a, um, the ability to do logging, um, similar to what you would see in an IT system like, like syslog or something to that effect. It has certain types of uh, encryption capability uh, and different types of um, user interfaces on the system. Uh, it's, it's used as an HMI in some applications. And really this product is meant to serve um, many of those uh, applications that the, the computing system originally started to serve uh, for the user in an embedded way now. Um, it has a logic controller on it. Like I mentioned, it was similar to a PLC. And it also has the ability to um, do communication processing. So if I have a device that speaks Modbus in the, in the control system, but I need to use a DMP SCADA master with that device, the RTAC can provide a uh, translation, if you will, from the DMP down to the Modbus. So if I, as I do a pull from my SCADA master uh, down to my controller, um, I'm able to do that pull via, via DMP and then the RTAC can provide that um, pull down to the, to the end unit with a Modbus and then send the information back to your SCADA master. So that kind of function is starting to look a lot like in what IT cybersecurity talks about as, as a firewall. Now, in our case, uh, we call that a, a protocol break um, because it's doing a, a bit more than what a firewall can typically do or perform. And we also provide the ability for the, the RTAC to do data aggregation, if you will. This way, the SCADA master, uh, which is, you know, a few layers above the core asset, um, doesn't necessarily have to have an end-to-end -end connection all the way down to your core asset. It's, it's providing a, a, a buffer, if you will, um, between the SCADA system and uh, the controllers. And those are some of the ideas that we are going to leverage, and, uh, and you're going to see that we've been leveraging over time in providing new types of uh, innovative um, solutions. This just talks a little bit more about the hardware. Um, like I said, it has several different types of form factors. And like I wanted to point out primarily is all the different types of um, communication ports that this, this device will serve uh, on the different form factors, providing even more of that kind of protocol break kind of concept uh, security control. Like I said, RTAC has many of the similar functions that um, you would, might see in an IT world. Um, we do this so that we can provide these functions, uh, not just from the RTAC specifically, but for the control system as a whole. So being able to collect log events that are specific to a control system environment can now be sent in different fashions uh, up to different types of um, dissemination devices. Uh, such as a uh, seam or uh, SCADA, SCADA master itself. One of the things that um, customers like to use the RTAC for, especially when it, we talk about this protocol break, is for secure terminal access. So instead of having to sit down and, and, and basically uh, communicate or uh, interact with the controller directly, uh, the idea is that I sit down and actually maybe interact with the 
the RTAC, which then can uh, proxy whatever it is down to the controller. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, here in a few minutes because that is a major, uh, not only a major type of application or a function that SEL continues to develop on, it's a security control that we believe in to the point where it's, it's really part of our security philosophy where uh, we see user accounts as uh, something that you would not want necessarily on ID, IEDs or controller devices. Secure engineering access um, allows us now to basically control what it is from a permission level uh, that takes place inside a distributed control system uh, down to an end device. So when a user does need to go out, maybe do a firmware update, maybe make a settings change, essentially we're monitoring that uh, as, a, as that user is, is uh, making changes or doing their job and being able to uh, provide that kind of accountability, if you will, of what is taking place uh, in the system. And if there is something that we don't want, you know, a, a user with specific, specific permissions or, uh, um, or just given the, given the safety conditions, we can block those commands or uh, user access um, permissions uh, down to the, to the IED. And that information can then be sent up to maybe an, uh, an IDS sensor. In this case, I'm showing the, the Dragos midpoint sensor, which uh, also now they have an embedded uh, de sensor device that, that's running inside of control systems to be able to collect all sorts of different uh, security event information. And so that's one thing that the RTAC has been doing for, for quite a while for us is being able to serve as that uh, accountability mechanism on what is happening inside of the control system from a user access perspective. Now that we're looking at cybersecurity features uh, that the RTAC can actually perform for the control system as a whole, uh, one of those things that we recently uh, included new capability in the RTAC, kind of moved it from, again, the computing type system now to an embedded type system, is the ability to to go out, pull individual devices and monitor things for like settings changes or firmware updates on the system. You can create a baseline now of uh, what your control system IEDs might have for settings or their, their present firmware. And if anything does change in one of those devices, be it a setting or a firmware uh, revision, uh, the RTAC can uh, report on that. And then you can also read baseline if it was a legitimate change. and uh, continue monitoring for the next uh, um, round of, or window of time. The RTAC can also now, because it's acting as that monitor, if you will, inside the system, basically collect any type of events from those systems as well. So some of these controllers will uh, alert or alarm on maybe a certain port or, or um, access taking place on, on, on one of those uh, devices. And at that, at that point, that event could go up to or alert the RTAC, which then can generate the syslog uh, for your IDS system or directly up to the seam. The good thing about this is now I don't have to worry about a heavier protocol like syslog needing to be down inside the, the IEDs or the controllers. I can use my PLC basically uh, with its logic engine to be able to collect those events and create those syslogs uh, from the PLC instead. And most of what I've been talking about is really kind of Ethernet type of concepts. But we can also do some of these concepts from, from a serial uh, connectivity perspective as well. Um, these devices can sit in front of controllers um, and directly connect and communicate with them over like other interfaces like serial ports or other types of like RS-485 or something like that. Last week I talked about uh, some of these solutions that we've been coming up with uh, aren't being developed inside of a silo. We've partnered with all sorts of uh, different uh, entities, some of them also being uh, vendors or manufacturers like Dragos and, and Juniper Networks, but also with the Department of Energy and National Labs. Uh, we've joined different programs with them 
uh, because we feel like uh, it's important that um, as we're innovating that some of these concepts, especially from a cybersecurity perspective, are vetted and something that the industry uh, can really take advantage of. One of those concepts early on uh, in our uh, development uh, of the RTAC was really kind of designing uh, a anti-malware system, if you will, for an embedded device that made sense for embedded devices. It's not a typical IT signature-based type of anti-malware, uh, which is really always a uh, issue with making sure that I have my updates in order to find the latest uh, type of threats or, or malware running out there in the system. Uh, this type of anti-malware is, is a whitelist type of, type of uh, concept. Um, essentially, what we've done is we, we had taken mandatory access controls, and because it's an embedded device with specific processes and threads um, with specific functions, we know that those specific processes and threads inside our embedded devices should only have access to certain resources, uh, and not only access to certain resources, but access to certain resources at certain times. And those resources being like file system uh, read or a um, certain driver inside the, the device. And so um, the idea is that we can lock down now these, these embedded devices with a internal way to monitor uh, what is happening inside inside of it and making sure that if anything were to do a buffer overflow attack or something like that, um, we would be able to pick up on uh, any kind of uh, out of range type of um, access or um, function calls uh, maybe that doesn't meet the timing that we expect inside the system. Um, in this project, uh, we developed this and we, we called it ExaGuard. It, it works on many of our embedded devices today. Uh, if there is something that it detects, um, it will send off a, a syslog to an IDS uh, sensor inside the system. Another one of those projects that uh, I'm really excited to talk about today and uh, is operational technology software-defined networking. Software-defined networking for, uh, has many different applications out there. And so different vendors will have uh, software-defined networking solutions um, meeting uh, different types of applications, which makes it look like software-defined networking um, means different things to different people. So it was originally designed uh, for data centers. And the idea was that with a traditional Ethernet switch, uh, which has the ability to um, learn how to forward packets and has different rules within it in order to uh, ensure that uh, a new switch can come online and not mess up the communications with other devices in the network in a dynamic way. With software-defined networking, that learning, if you will, in each one of those individual packet forwarding switches has been taken out and centralized and that centralized uh, control plane now is really what we call the software side or the software controller of a local area network. Explain this a little bit further. Um, for reactive SDN, when a packet comes into a switch, the switch will ask the controller, well, how should I forward this packet? And it's the controller that sends down a rule to all the different switches in order for that packet to make it through the network. Now I'm going to explain a different way that SDN could potentially work. So instead of waiting for the packet to come in to the, to the network and be forwarded, the controller could send out a, a rule to all the switches uh, beforehand. And we call this proactive OTSDN. Um, and with this, what we now are able to do, the concept, is now we're able to uh, engineer the network as we engineer the control system. And so I, I create all of these virtual paths, if you will, uh, almost virtual circuits 
through the network for all the different types of communications that I need. So because the switches aren't learning any longer, the, the devices have to be basically told what to do. And so as we proactively engineer these switches to do uh, the packet forwarding, one of the things that we're now able to take advantage of that traditional Ethernet is not able to, to do is we're able to take advantage of all the links inside of our local area network. In traditional Ethernet networks, uh, you can't have a loop. And so there's functions and applications running inside of the switches in order to do loop, mi loop mitigation. Now we're able to actually provide um, the engineer and a control system multiple paths and loops in our system can be taken advantage of now and it isn't a detriment to the overall network. In this case, um, I have a primary path, a backup path, and a secondary path. It may be difficult to see the colors uh, given the, the screen and I apologize about that. Uh, the primary path uh, is going through the middle of the, of the network. I have a, maybe a primary path uh, for a controller communications um, from my PLC RTAC down to my IED relay. And I have a secondary path for that going uh, down below um, through two, or uh, excuse me, through an additional 2740S. So I have a duplicate packet going in that direction as well. I also have a, a backup path up at the top. I've engineered now a backup path inside my network so that if something happens to one of my uh, links, primary or, or secondary, I can now send that up the top. I could also have the ability to send SCADA kind of communications through my network. So I might have SCADA also going down one of these links. We'll say maybe SCADA is going through the secondary path. What happens now is if I have a fault, in my system. My primary path now fails over to my, to my backup path. If I have a fault or a, a, basically I lose link on my uh, backup path, I can now take advantage of my secondary path and basically now have maybe both SCADA and duplicate packets moving through my secondary path inside the system. One of the differences here between a proactive SDN type of network um, is proactive does not need the flow controller. So now I'm able to engineer this network and then the flow controller can go offline and is no longer needed because uh, it's no longer making decisions uh, for the network. The network has already been uh, programmed up front to begin with. In this drawing, I'm showing uh, different types of uh, communications taking place through uh, an OTSDN network. Uh, I have built-in failover in my system. Um, one of the things that uh, also this type of technology now provides is a faster failover time, uh, where you would typically see with a, a traditional Ethernet network, uh, maybe at best 10 milliseconds of time and packet loss um, in an RSTP reconvergence or up to maybe even a second of packet loss. Pre-programming those failovers now allows us to not only fail over in less than 100 microseconds, our failovers have actually become deterministic. And because of that, um, it really shows how a typical traditional Ethernet type solution really doesn't work for control systems, control communications. Uh, whereas now we have a technology that's interoperable with Ethernet, able to take advantage of the, the fact that your failover times are deterministic and we can make sure that we typically don't even lose a single packet inside the system. In this network, I have categorized and separated out my engineering access, my SCADA, and my, my control system uh, communications. 
Uh, the other cool thing about this technology is certain links or flows can be ephemeral, meaning that my engineering access isn't something I would typically always have enabled inside my system. I could wait for some sort of um, indicator or uh, authentication mechanism before I even enable that engineering access set of protocols to take place inside my network. The other thing about this communications um, and these flows is that I'm calling out these types of protocols, uh, you know, my SCADA protocols versus my engineering access protocols. Engineering access protocols would be something like Telnet, SSH, FTP, whereas my DMP communicator communications would be like my SCADA communications. So I'm no longer uh, constrained by lookups that inside my switches that are just MAC address lookups or maybe uh, IP and MAC address lookups. I can now do lookups based on anything in that first 128 bytes of the, the packet. Now, we're using uh, a protocol called OpenFlow. Uh, which provides the, um, the configuration of the switches from the controller. OpenFlow does have some limitations on the types of um, uh, things that the uh, switches can basically do lookups on, but I can pretty much now use ether type, TCP port, MAC address, IP address, uh, and many other things in order to basically determine what type of packets I do rules for uh, forwarding traffic through my network. With a embedded uh, IDS sensor inside the network, from a cybersecurity perspective, we have quite a bit more that we can do uh, with this type of solution. So instead of having that sensor look at basically uh, all the packets inside the network, I can pick and choose what packets and filter down what packets that from a control system perspective are ones that I wouldn't maybe worry about inside my network. An example might be given this type of network, um, we can see now that DMP polls maybe from an automated perspective are happening uh, once a second. And so I would expect that DMP poll to happen every second on top of the second. And if I ever see a, a packet come in, maybe even from the same location, out of sequence, well, I, that, that, that's something that, a behavior inside my system that I didn't expect. That packet should probably go to my intrusive detection sensor. Those are the types of ideas or things that we can do now uh, with this type of technology. I also have, uh, with this technology, the ability to um, take a look at different types of metrics on the network. How many packets did I have in the last hour that were DMP only, et cetera. So for some regulations, uh, they require that any unused ports be turned off uh, in your system for cybersecurity reasons. In an OTSDN network now though, one of the things that is neat about this is if I do have an unauthorized ac um, access or uh, someone plugs in a laptop into a port that isn't configured or anything, not only am I protected inside the network because I don't have any flows for those that traffic, I'm also now able to monitor and watch what it is that that rogue device uh, is trying to do on my network. And that type of information, I can collect it and now send that into the intrusion detection sensor. So instead of disabling ports in the typical traditional sense, I can, I can essentially use those ports as a way, as a means to monitor as to what's happening inside my network. That goes uh, along the same way as a uh, engineer entering the network and attempting to do something maybe malicious. But even if they were not trying to do something themselves malicious knowingly, even if there's like some malware on their system, so they're doing their job and they have maybe engineering access flows um, set up for that, and I'm monitoring what it is that they're doing inside the system. If there's some malware trying to do uh, maybe a scan in the system, that's going to be 
not only blocked because I don't have flows for that type of actions or packets, but I can also now send that to my intrusion detection system. Also, if there's a, a malware like a worm attempting to pivot or move around in the network, that too is going to be picked up. And um, just because I don't have the flows for that worm to typically flow around in the, in the network any longer. There's, of course, future ideas. This, is, um, this technology has been out for a few years, but we continue to build upon it. Um, Cloud-based computing type of ideas now because SDN itself is is a cloud-based computing uh, type of technology and concept. We're continuing to look at additional uh, complementary cloud-based technology that makes sense for the control system, um, not necessarily bringing down the cloud into a control system directly. But what is the technology that's up there uh, that people are developing and, and creating that we can maybe take advantage of in a different way for control systems? I wanted to talk one last uh, aspect here, uh, secure engineering access. Uh, like I said before, one of the things that we do with an RTAC is we can provide a means by which the user, instead of interacting directly with the controller, like in this picture I have relays as my IEDs, uh, they can interact now uh, through an RTAC. And we call this kind of management or contr uh, security control a user proxy security control. So this allows us to monitor what it is that the, the individual is doing uh, before it actually gets down into the controller. It also provides me with a way to uh, manage uh, um, the, the fact that maybe IEDs or controllers don't have user accounts, nor the, the technology or protocols necessary for centralized role-based access control. And it allows me now to provide kind of a credential management down into those IEDs. And that's something I'm going to talk a little bit more about here pretty soon. So we have this capability today. Um, the other thing that we can do is, is like a check device checkout kind of concept. So if uh, a user needs to have direct access, essentially, I can still log in with my credentials on one of these um, user proxy devices. And I say, okay, I need to speak to this controller. In this case, I have a relay. I do a checkout, and that user proxy service provides me with a temporary credential, maybe a password, uh, to get into that controller directly. Because there are times when the engineer or technician does need direct access. When I'm done, I can either check it back in, or maybe I forget to check it in, and there's a timeout, and then that credential is basically expired, and, or maybe a password is rotated in, down in the, uh, the controller device directly. Uh, also, you know, we're able to now syslog the fact that this is an individual that interacted with the device, and the device as well maybe have, has some sort of uh, alert saying, hey, I was just interacted with. And you can correlate that now uh, in your uh, security information event management system. So one of the things that uh, we're doing is building upon this concept. Many of our customers ask for user accounts in the IEDs and controllers directly. Uh, from a control system perspective, we kind of scratch our heads and wonder if that's a very good idea. And I use this example because as we were doing some studies in how uh, some of the utilities do access these uh, core assets, the, the controllers, the relays, the IEDs, um, we took a look at uh, a customer who's look, who, who wanted basically user accounts inside their system. Uh, this customer had approximately 3,000 computers and end-user devices that they were managing for their employees. The employees, of course, were constantly interacting with those devices, with their user accounts and role-based access control. They had approximately 750 IT appliances, things like routers, firewalls, switches, in their corporate network. And their IT personnel, which numbered around 45, accessed those type of devices, making changes or uh, doing maintenance and updates on them uh, 
approximately once a week per device. The OT devices, relays, uh, meters, uh, other types of controllers, PLCs, those numbered in thousands compared to the other devices uh, for uh, this particular utility. Uh, they had approximately 12,000 at the time. And those assets were accessed approximately, um, well, many times less than a year, um, and many times not even, even once a year. So out of those 12,000 devices, they had approximately about 40 individuals in the 3,000 employees um, that really were the ones that interacted directly with them. They had engineers, they had um, other folks in the company that um, basically all, all needed maybe information from those devices. But the number of individuals, the actual users that had any type of direct access, maybe settings changes, numbered in maybe 40. The core assets, the actual controllers like relays uh, for this utility, it was about 8,000 of those 12,000 devices and about half the number of employees uh, of the 40 had access to those devices. So, so we asked the question, so given 20 individuals who have access to a majority of this utility's devices, but rarely, if ever, touched any of those. In fact, those 20 individuals would maybe uh, never in their lifetime touch every single one of those devices. And given the fact that employees are typically the number one targeted and compromised asset of any organization, we had to ask, why would we want to tie a user account and central based access control directly to those controllers, which are the core assets of the company, and include all those protocols like LDAP, Radius, et cetera, with all of its complexity to those devices, given we already have the ability to do authentication, authorization, and accountability. So this is the reason why we think for control systems, we're going down a different path so we looked at what the customer's needs were, which is really, like I said, uh, authentication, authorization, and accountability. We looked at the protocols. We know that they provide uh, all sorts of security concerns, just having those protocols tied to whatever device that you might have. And we started thinking from the password or credential perspective that maybe more of a token-based architecture made more sense. And when we started looking at this, um, it, re it, it drastically reduces the complexity in the IEDs. It provides all of the, the features I need from an authentication, authorization, and accountability perspective. And not only that, when we looked at the NIST security controls by removing and, or not having user accounts or role-based access control or centralized um, protocol support, it alleviated 71 of my security controls. It actually reduced my overall threat uh, footprint, if you will, on the systems. Token-based access control is very simple, uh, makes a lot of sense from a um, uh, ease of use for the customer perspective. They, they, you know, they log into the laptop, and then from there, uh, the organization, if they have permission, provides them with the tokens necessary for them to, to get their job completed. All right. And with that, I wanted to thank you. Um, like I said, we were, we're thinking about all sorts of different ways to uh, not only create purpose-built technology that's meant for control systems, but also technologies that's interoperable uh, with what it is that customers are used to today. So with that, I um, hand it back to Dave for questions.
Perfect. Thanks very much, Dennis. Appreciate you uh, taking the time. That was a really, uh, really great, really detailed presentation. Um, so I guess to start off, um, I'm kind of familiar with uh, Schweitzer in terms of some of your other products. Um, and I know that in, in a lot of what you guys build, you guys actually have uh, some, some uh, test tools and other things in-house there that uh, sort of separate you guys even from a lot of um, what we call industrial networking type of gear. Um, so when it comes to the IT side, um, could you talk a little bit about some of what you guys do to qualify your products in terms of uh, in, you know, industrial or robust? Yes. Um, so SEL is a manufacturer, so we not only uh, research and develop these products, we, we also manufacture them here in North America, close to home. Uh, we, want, we want that manufacturing close so that our engineers, uh, because it's for critical infrastructure, we want our engineers to be able to um, uh, be close to that manufacturer in case there was something that we needed to um, improve or uh, get to root cause on. And um, so supply chain security, from that perspective, uh, we, we take a look at it from not just the manufacturing perspective, but also the research and development perspective. So in uh, the tool question, uh, we, from a cybersecurity perspective, I'll, I'll focus on that first. Um, we fuzz our pro um, all of our inputs on our devices. Uh, all of our devices have um, uh, unit testing performed as well as functional testing. And then from an interoperability and compliance perspective, especially on the Ethernet side, uh, we have tools like uh, the Ixia to ensure that we're meeting the, the standards. Those are just examples. Right, cool. Um, I'm just gonna uh, share my, my screen out here just with the um, question slide on it there. Um, so if you, if you wanna put in a question, you just uh, go to the little Zoom console, click on the Q&A button, type your question in there and it'll come up on my dashboard and we'll be able to discuss it. So um, I guess the, uh, another one that, uh, that popped in here is uh, a question, uh, just curious what the BNC port is. Early in your slideshow, you had a, um, you had a showing, I, th I think it was the back of a unit and there was a number of ports mm -hmm. there. Yep. Um, one of them was a BNC and I, uh, I think it's just asking what that's for. Yes. Um, that, that is our um, precise time input, one of our precise time inputs. Um, for control system, precise time is very important, like I said, uh, making sure that uh, everything is deterministic. So pre precise time in a control system is um, very critical. Uh, that B and C is for IRIG B. It's an IRIG B input for uh, doing precise time. We, we also, um, as we, we include Ethernet in the devices. Uh, we also have um, support the precise time protocol as well. Right. Cool. Um, so, and a customer, if they're going to go with um, your solution, then do they basically pick um, one or more layers of their of their network, and then kind of say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna use them in, in this area. So you guys are uh, the switches. You're the SDN. You're you know, all, all of the, those different components in, in a specific layer or, or how, how do they kind of um, pick and choose uh, how to place you guys inside of, uh, you know, their, their entire network there? Yeah, that's a great question. So we use the defense in depth and that model I was showing uh, just to, uh, to kind of identify the types of applications uh, that's taking place inside of their control system. And so they'll typically have core applications, the type of applications that they, uh, the control system must take place in order for the control system to really survive. And so that really is kind of our layer one or core of that system. So we use the model from a security design perspective. If you purchase like a relay or an RTAC, um, depending on what you wish to do with the RTAC, the RTAC may be a layer two device, or maybe it'll be a layer three device. So layer two is like an automation device. I would do things like uh, maybe secure engineering access, uh, communication processing, data aggregation, maybe even some uh, supporting logic inside the system. Uh, or it could be at a layer three, which is my access point. 
and an access point, maybe I'm, I have that RTAC serving more of a protocol break, if you will, inside the system. So I guess uh, the important thing is to think of not these layers as, oh, this, this product belongs in this layer all the time. It's really about the types of functions that that product's serving for the system. And our core assets from a digital perspective um, is in layer one. Your overall control system assets are the, are the layer zero. Right, okay, perfect. All right, so we've come pretty well near to the end of the presentation. Um, I'm hopeful that Dennis's audio might uh, might come back in a little bit. So, but I'm just going to carry on and basically thank everybody, um, including Dennis, Nick, and Brian. Uh, we had three really interesting presentations today. Wanted to thank everybody who's joined us. Um, you know, we really enjoy doing these automation village sessions, and you know, we we get to learn a lot about them, and we hope that you guys also learn a lot. Um, about some of the things that are going on in the industry right now. And hopefully once we all are, are back in the office and, and spending a little more time on site, um, we'll have a, a fresh view, uh, fresh pieces of information to kind of uh, plan for the end of 2020 and hope for uh, a very efficient 2021. Um, so thanks to everybody for, for joining us today. Um, our next event will be um, on June 11th. And that's going to be another Automation Village trade show. So it's another three-hour event, but we usually have around a dozen presentations during that one. So they're much shorter presentations. Um, they're sort of high-level uh, pieces. And then from there, we'll go into um, usually around nine people will come in with uh, break it says in presentations, which are given roughly a week later. So they say on uh, June 11th, we'll be coming to you um, with a focus on the Houston area. So we hope to see you then. I hope you guys have a great day.